Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash Togiak. I encountered a Wendigo while making a remote border crossing. We've got crows back at home. In my town we see them every day. Sometimes solo, sometimes in a group. I am well aware that a group of crows is referred to as a murder, but despite this ominous label, they're pretty shy and generally fly away at the first sign of danger. But the pair of big black birds circling the point across the lake were something else entirely. I know that around the Canadian border ravens become more common than crows, and this is what I suppose they were. But these were really big, too big, possibly bigger than an eagle. And as they circled the point, the calls they made were unnerving. Nothing like the caw of a crow, the sounds were screeching drawn out croaks, as though to make sure that every creature on the lake was aware of their presence. I kept quiet from my vantage point 200 yards across the bay, and the travelers I had in my charge knew enough to keep still and silent. We were three quarters done with our journey that had begun at a clandestine location outside of Atikokan. I never thought I could become a smuggler, but here I was, tucked under ancient white pines with a man and woman who were essentially strangers to me. They watched the huge birds with me, whispering back and forth in their native language. I don't know what they were saying but the look in their eyes showed their fear. And these people have seen things in their homeland bad enough for them to leave with nothing more than a few possessions, and then give all of their money to a stranger who arranged for me to take them through the wilderness to cross the most remote section of the largest unguarded border in the world. Traveling by canoe along a route that my ancestors have traveled since long before there was a border, we had crossed the imaginary line last night and by this time tomorrow I plan to load them into a van that would be waiting at a trailhead near Ely. This was where we would part ways. For now we were preparing to break camp at a campsite known only to me. I carved it out of the timber a few years ago, and it is able to conceal not only a tent but a canoe as well. There's not much canoe traffic this time of year, but I was doing a final check to make sure the coast was clear when the birds showed up. Figuring there must be something along the shore holding their interest, I fished my binoculars out of my pack to get a closer look at the sinister pair. To the naked eye it looked like a typical rocky point on a shield lake, a smooth rock shoreline gave way to a stand of sparse bulrushes with a couple of boulders. One of the boulders didn't look right. I realized that I was actually looking at a dead moose that had floated up there. Likely a casualty from the moose season that ended the week before. That explained why the pair of birds were circling, and I pulled the binoculars away to study how the birds were behaving. They took turns swooping down low over the moose and then soaring higher than the treetops and letting out their disturbing calls. Then there was movement in the trees. I pulled the binoculars back up and focused in on the mix of birch and fir that was along the shoreline. At first I thought it was a bear, coming down to take advantage of the dead moose. But this was far taller than a bear. Then I saw the antlers. Some smaller trees parted and then what at first I thought was a moose stepped to the water's edge. I've seen hundreds of moose in my time up here, but what I was seeing now didn't make sense. Sure it had antlers, and it was tall like a moose. But it was mostly without fur, and the color was all wrong, more of a sickly pinkish gray than the dark brown you would expect of a moose. I could see its ribs. And its front legs weren't really legs, they were more like long, gangly arms arms that ended in long bony fingers. 
Even though I was about 200 yards away I could see the glint of fangs. It stepped from the trees to the water's edge. It paused and looked up at the circling birds. It let out a scream that hung in the air. One of my travelers let out a whimper, and I turned put a raised finger across my lips. I knew we were out of sight of what any typical animal or person could see, but this was far from typical. I flashed back to many years before when I stared wide-eyed at my grandfather as he told stories around the campfire. Flames flickered and birch logs crackled as he described an evil spirit called the Wendigo. Many generations ago a lost hunter turned to cannibalism to survive, and his evil deed transformed him into a horrific beast. A beast that roamed the wilds with an insatiable hunger for flesh. Human or otherwise. While this story terrified me as a child, I never gave it any thought as an adult, as the elders had many tales of spirits and such. But here I was, miles from the nearest road, two strangers in my care, looking at the impossible. I subconsciously reached to feel the outline of my revolver tucked into the back of my pants. The beast had now waded into the water and its claws began tearing at the moose carcass. It ripped off huge chunks of flesh, hide, and bone with ease, shoving them into his gaping mouth where they were crunched and swallowed. The water around the moose carcass was soon tinged red with blood and a pair of giant birds took roost in a tall pine above the beast. The carnage continued as the creature consumed impossible amounts in minutes. I heard one of the travelers whisper, Monstoro. I didn't need translation to know what it meant. They had every reason to be scared now. I've had face-to-face -face standoffs with wild bears, with big city gangs, with angry fathers. At least with those you have an idea of what you are dealing with. My grandfather never said how one would deal with a wendigo. With most of the moose consumed, the monster let out another scream. I was back to looking through binoculars, which was a mistake as the beast's face and chest were covered in blood, and flesh clung to its claws. An image I will never be able to erase. Despite having consumed the better part of an adult moose it was still gaunt in appearance. It took a last look around and I stopped breathing when its gaze seemed to focus on our location for a moment. It slowly turned towards shore and then disappeared into the brush. This cued the black birds to come down for what was left. One bird rested on the moose's hindquarter and picked away at intestines, the other rested on the head and feasted on the eyes and torn open neck. After a few minutes they flew up silently, circled over our location and then headed in the general direction the Wendigo had gone. At least they went in the opposite direction we were headed. We sat in silence for a time, then I pulled out a map. I showed the travelers where we were, where the Wendigo had gone, and where we needed to go to complete the journey. I showed them my gun, which I had kept hidden from them until now, hoping it would ease their fears. It didn't do much to ease my fears. It was a .357 revolver, enough to stop a bear, but what would it do to a Wendigo? I suspected there needed to be some version of a silver bullet to stop an evil spirit. I gestured to them to pack their belongings, which they did quickly and quietly. I calculated that if we traveled lightly and quickly we could be out by nightfall. I decided to leave the tent and everything else not essential. We slid the canoe down the bank, climbed in and pushed off. The woman sat on the floor in the middle, the man was at the bow. I paddled from the stern with intensity we had about 10 miles to the end of the lake. At the end of the lake was a portage trail of about a half mile that would bring us to the next lake. 
We had done a number of portages already on this trip, and after the morning's events I was dreading having to be on foot. There was no other way out. A light wind was at our back, allowing for relatively quick travel. The man was paddling as best he could, but it was marginally helpful at best. The woman kept her head down and did not move. Usually on this kind of trip I try to hug the shoreline to keep a low profile, but now we were tracking right down the middle of the lake. I was making a beeline for a height of land where I knew the portage was, and we continued along in silence. The paddle down the long lake was uneventful, and it was early afternoon when we reached the portage. Once ashore we took a short break and ate some jerky, and then it was time to make the portage. It would be easier now since I had abandoned most of the gear. On earlier portages I had the travelers hide out while I scouted ahead to make sure we would not meet anyone on the trail, but there was no time for that. I think they understood me as I tried to explain the importance of moving quickly and quietly. I pointed to the trail and then to the packs and paddles. They took the cue and I put the canoe up on my shoulders and we plodded along through the forest. It took less than an hour to get to the next lake. There was a forest fire here several years before, and the charred remains of a few old-growth pines stood in stark contrast to the young aspen, birch and spruce that had grown in the void left by the fire. This lake was smaller, with many bays and points, and we were soon back to making progress in the canoe. Wendy 5 we came around a point midway down the lake. I looked to the end of the lake where we would find the next portage and stopped padding. Maybe 300 yards away was the remains of a burnt pine. Roosting in the tree were two birds. Big, black birds. The man in the bow saw them too, and muttered something to the woman. She looked up for the first time and stifled a scream. We had to go past them to get to the next portage, so I kept paddling down the middle, not taking my eyes off the birds. As we got closer it was obvious they were watching us too, their heads pivoting as we passed them. I kept looking back over my shoulder at them, but they held their position. I didn't know what the presence of the birds on our route signified, but based on what I saw this morning it couldn't be good. By the time we were at the end of lake where the next portage was, I could barely make out the tree anymore. I thought that perhaps we were in the clear, but then we all heard the unmistaken sound, the same sound we heard the birds making this morning. Even though they had to be over a mile away there was no mistaking it. The long, drawn-out croaking continued for a minute, then it was silent again. I paddled towards shore so hard that the bow slid two feet onto the bank. Go. 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 I yelled. The travelers seemed shocked at my yelling, as I had not said anything to them in the few days we had been together that wasn't a whisper. They both scrambled out of the canoe, grabbed the gear and headed up the path. I again wrestled the canoe onto my shoulders and followed. We still had another lake to cross after this portage, then it was down a creek to where we were to be picked up in a remote parking lot at the end of a forest road. We would be early, but maybe I could get a cell phone signal and get a call or text to the driver. Or maybe we could hitch a ride with a tourist. Any concerns of being intercepted by authorities has now taken a back seat to getting out of here and away from that thing that for all I knew was making its way south toward us. Since we were closer to an access point, this mile-long portage was well-traveled and we made good time. The first half was up a slight incline, then it went down much more steeply to the next lake. We reached the top, and paused for a quick rest. I set the canoe down to catch my breath. 
The crest of the trail allowed a good view of the valley ahead. It also allowed a good view of two huge, black birds that were circling above the treetops. The woman was not able to stifle her scream this time, and this prompted the birds to start up with their ominous calls. In the distance we heard another sound. It was a scream, a scream that could have only come from the horror we had seen this morning. While I felt a certain amount of responsibility to the travelers, my concern for them was waning. You better keep up. I yelled as hoisted the canoe back onto my shoulders. I headed down the steep trail as fast as I could, and I could hear the travelers behind me, stumbling, but not falling too far behind. With the canoe on my shoulders I couldn't see if they were carrying the paddles. Didn't matter, I keep a spare strapped to the supports in the canoe. The steep path made a switchback and was able to see that the man was indeed carrying a paddle and pack, the woman was crying hysterically, carrying nothing. The path here was steep and rough, with many large rocks and roots creating potential tripping hazards. The birds were circling overhead us now, their croaks echoing off the hillside. We heard the distant scream again, although this time it didn't sound so distant. It was not possible for us to move any faster, but I took care to be sure-footed. I could see we were nearly to the bottom of the hill. Once there it would be level ground to the next lake, which was now only a few hundred yards away. I made it to the bottom of the hill where the well-worn path went through a series of large roots and then turned to dirt. Once to the dirt I flipped the canoe off my shoulders and let it land on the hull. The travelers were coming up fifty yards behind me. I grabbed the bow of the canoe and started dragging it, hoping the man would catch up and grab the stern. I started to yell at the couple to hurry but I was interrupted by another scream from the beast. It was coming from our right and I could now hear branches breaking and what sounded like breathing and snarling. There was no reason to think that the lake would offer refuge from this thing, but it seemed like a better option than facing it here on the path. The man was almost caught up to me, but he stopped to see where his partner was. She had tripped on a root and was now screaming, not sure if it was in pain or terror. Probably more terror, as the wendigo had broken through the brush along the trail and was now fifty feet behind her. She looked back at it and let out what she meant to be a scream but came out as a yelp. The beast was on her in seconds, and it picked her up over its head and slammed her to the ground. The man dropped to his knees, watching in horror as his partner was torn apart and devoured. When the eight I resumed dragging the canoe as fast as I could, not looking back. The beast let out another shriek, then there was a scream that I presumed to be from the man. I tried not to think about the snapping and crunching sounds I could hear from behind me. The next lake was now in sight and even though my entire body wanted to quit I was now running. The shoreline was sandy and I ran right into the water, allowing the canoe to float past me. I hopped in when the back seat was even with me, and in one motion pulled the tag end of the knot that held my spare paddle in place. A few quick strokes and I was twenty yards from shore. The screams of the beast continued, and the black birds that had been watching the bloodbath from treetops now were starting to swoop around me, getting closer with each pass. The wendigo was now on the shoreline and it let out the loudest scream of all. It stepped in the water to its knees but stopped, gesturing with its long arms and howling at the sky. Not knowing what to do next, I pulled out my revolver. At the end of this lake was the outlet stream that would lead me to a bridge. For the moment I felt safer where I was. The birds were getting ever bolder, and I could feel the wind as one of them swooped in on me from behind my shoulder. 
It wheeled around over the bow and came right back at me. It reared back at arm's length with its wings spread and its talons coming right at my face. Taking advantage of a perfect opportunity one pointed the gun barrel at the bird center and pulled the trigger. Black feathers flew and the now silenced bird landed in the water and strangely sank out of sight. The other bird flew up high and then quickly descended, coming right at me. I had the gun raised, but the bird did not offer a good target and it flew past my head. Sensing weakness, it circled around and attacked, pecking me on the back of the head with its massive beak. I had to be careful not to tip as I tried to fend it off with the paddle. More determined than ever, the bird came back at me. I fired twice, missing both times. With three rounds left in the gun, I knew I better choose my next shots carefully. The bird came from behind me again, this time it wheeled around quickly, planting its talons on my chest and pecking at my eyes. My attempts to fend it off with a fist were not successful and it got a hold of my eyebrow. I could feel flesh pulling away from my skull, and I pointed the gun right at it and even though I thought the barrel was pressed right into it I still missed. I resorted to using the gun as a bludgeon that I slammed into its neck. This had a noticeable effect, it let out a deep croak and let go its grip. I was not watching the wendigo at this point, focused on the dark feathered assailant. I could hear it though, as it let out shrieks and screams louder than a siren. The remaining black bird, shook up some from the pistol whipping, flew in a crooked path now, obviously having difficulty maintaining its course. I felt confident I could take it down with one of my remaining rounds. It came straight at me, I let it peck the top of my head as it went by. It circled around again, and once more I let it get me with a good peck to my temple. It made another loop around, and I was ready when it followed the same path of attack. It came right at me, and I was looking down the barrel right at the bird's head when I pulled the trigger. The raven's head disintegrated in a cloud of black feathers and blood and the headless body landed at my feet, wings still flapping, talons still grasping. The shrieks of the wendigo suddenly stopped. It stood motionless, staring out at the lake, not necessarily at me. I set the gun on the seat next to me, there was still one round left. I used the paddle as a shovel to lift the dead bird over the side and into the lake, where it too strangely sank out of sight. The wendigo, while still a fearsome looking beast with its face and claws covered in blood and flesh, had lost its menacing posture. I pointed the revolver at it, right at its head. I was confident I could hit it, not confident that my one remaining bullet would kill it. For some reason I thought about the old saying, that if carrying a handgun for bare protection you should save the last round for yourself. Pretty sure the old saying applies here. I lowered the gun and watched the beast. With its long bony arms hanging at its sides it turned towards shore and with two big steps it was crashing through the timber, heading away from the lake, away from me, away from my exit point. I sat quietly for a minute, trying to take all of this in. I could no longer hear the sounds of branches breaking. Was the wendigo gone? Apparently they can't, or won't swim. The ravens must act as seers or scouts for the wendigo, once they were eliminated it was like a switch was flipped. I thought about the hapless travelers. I knew it was pointless to go back to where I had last seen them. What would happen to me when I left the lake? It was now late in the afternoon. I slid the revolver with its one bullet into the back of my jeans, picked up the paddle and headed for the outlet creek. Second story. This story was shared by you slash boy with a loaf of bread. 
all the urban legends about me are wrong. Throughout all of human history, there has been one constant throughout the variables of civilization's advancement, stories. As mankind moved away from small clay huts to monolithic steel skyscrapers, the yearning to tell and listen to stories has always persisted. It's a way of not only growing and evolving the mind, it's a way of connecting with one another. Yet out of all the methods of storytelling that have evolved from the small carvings of stick figures along Neolithic walls, there's one in particular that seems to strike a nerve more than any other, legends of horror. From the very moment you learn to tuck your children into bed, or gather around in communion by a fire, stories of dark and terrifying creatures have invaded your nightmares through the catalyst of scary stories. Many of these classics have become so immovable in human culture, that they've transformed from mere tales of horror to urban legends. Out of the plethora of dark tales told in the night, there's one that holds a certain interest close to my heart. The tales of a mysterious interloper that plays a mesmerizing tune from his pipe to lure unsuspecting children to their doom in the forest brings a certain interest to me, not because of how it can scare the shit out of a misfit to try and get them to behave, it's because it's about me. Yes, yes, I know what you must be thinking. What the fuck is this guy talking about? Well, just let me explain. First of all, for those of you who are unaware of the tale of the Pied Piper, let me give you a small rundown. Originating from Germany, the legend tells of a town overrun with rats. The rodents feast on the town's produce and spread death and disease, eventually the town tries to hire a mysterious rat wrangler out of desperation. The wrangler plays his magic pipe causing all the rats of the town to drown themselves in the sewers and wells of the town. Upon receiving no payment for his services, the piper begins to play a tune late at night, causing all the children of the town to get out of bed and head for the river. It is then that one by one, each child walks into said river, drowning themselves. Pretty fucked up right? That's because it's wrong. The legends have been misconstrued through a game of urban telephone lasting generations. Well that's why I'm here, to set the record straight. So here we go. The Legend of the Pied Piper, written by yours truly. Once upon a time in the mystical land of Germany, there lived a being of the earth. This being was strong and intelligent and had just as many hopes and aspirations as man. Yet he was not of man. He knew many things about himself, except from that of where he came from. The being spent many long years in the forests, educating himself about the world around him as well as its inhabitants. During the day he would spend time with his friends, who were the fellow inhabitants of the forest floor. At night he would take his musical pipe fashioned from the pine of the trees around him, and play. Music was like a drug for the piper. He knew many songs, of which he would play a new tune every night. Once every so often, the piper would play one song through his instrument he knew all too well. The Song of Hunger. Unlike the rest, this song would reach far and wide in the land around him, yet only one other would ever hear it. This other, would be a child. Just one, no more, no less. As the music would play, the child would go off wandering away from home, into the forest. Almost every encounter between the children and the piper would be the same. The entranced child would walk into the woods smiling a cleaning smile as they came to the source of the wonderful tune. They would look up and see the piper perched along one of the tree branches up above. Are you the one who plays such lovely music? The child would ask. It would be then that the music would stop. Almost immediately after silence returned to the forest, 
the child would look around in complete adolescent confusion. Having absolutely no idea where they were, or how they got there, they would look up at the piper and ask how to get home. Home. The piper would ask hopping down from his tree branch, my sweet delectable child, you are not going home. For a short time afterward the piper approached the child, the quiet forest would be filled with the screams of pain and anguish as the child would be feasted upon by the piper. Tendon by tendon, limb by limb, bone by bone, the piper would consume and leave nothing to waste. But out of everything consumed, the fear and pain of the child would fill the pipe's belly more than anything. It would strengthen his essence with every scream and cry for mercy, to which there would be none. Once the meal was finished, the piper would dig far below for a short while and sleep. Every so often he would awaken for a season and play music, engage with his friends of the forest, and consume a meal. Then he would return back to the ground for another short while to sleep once again. On one particular awakening however, he was not greeted to surrounding trees as he crept forth from the ground, but by houses and streets of stone. The wonderful forest he had known all his life had become the town of Hamelin. The piper was disgusted by what man had done to his home. However, peering through his anger was curiosity. He would roam the streets of Hamelin, seeing its many inhabitants while also searching for any remnants of his old home. Eventually he came to the river of Hamelin and was filled with delight. The same water that had run through the forest floor still flowed through the ground surrounding the town. But all of this adventuring had done the piper in, his belly was gumbling. He was hungry. But the piper knew he could not walk into the town of Hamelin and take a child just because of his appetite, that was rude. And while man may have been rude, he was not. But he was angry. Angry at the perversion that man had done to his home. So as he sat on the outer banks behind the town of Hamelin in the dark of the night, he smiled as a plan arose in his mind. That next morning, dawn arose over a Hamelin under siege by hordes of rats. The rodents themselves had arrived by another one of the piper's talented songs. Day by day for weeks the people of Hamelin would try to stomp and smash all the rats, but to no avail. All hope for the little town had seemed lost, until one day the piper came strolling through the streets to the mayor's home. The mayor was weary and tired from the troubling invasion of rats, but was overjoyed when the piper offered a solution. For sufficient payment, I shall find your streets of the rodent infestation. The piper said with a smile. Oh but of course. Anything for someone who could save our troubled town. Exclaimed the mayor. That day the piper walked out onto the streets of Hamelin and played another tune on his pipe. The music carried over all of the rats of the town as they safely evacuated the town just as they had appeared. The townspeople rejoiced and clapped as their filthy streets were clean of rodents one again. Upon the completion of his work, the piper returned to the mayor for adequate compensation for his work. How much coin for your service? Asked the mayor of Hamelin. None, replied the piper. For a moment the mayor was confused, until the piper continued. I only ask for your child. The piper said with a smile on his face and a deeper grumbling in his belly. With a face of rage and disgust, the mayor threw the piper out of his home, as the people of Hamelin beat and bruised him till he left their town. It was here that the piper had been changed forever. For the first time in his entire life, he looked back at the distant town of Hamelin, with revenge in his eyes. That night, 
The piper's song of hunger filled the air of Hamelin and lifted each dreaming child of the town out of their bed. In the midst of twilight, the children murdered their parents in their sleep, the perfect betrayal as repentance for their betrayal of the piper. Covered in blood the children walked down the streets of Hamelin, carried by the soothing song of the piper. As they came to the river outside of the town, one by one the children walked into the river. By dawn, every single child of the town floated in the bloody river of Hamelin, except for one. The son of the mayor, the piper's payment. There and then the piper feasted once again, next to the river filled with the true pests of Hamelin. The child's screams carried far in the crisp morning air, yet there was no one left to hear it. With his belly full and the town emptied. The piper dug himself a place in the ground to sleep once again for a short while. And unlike the wretched people of Hamelin, the piper lived happily ever after. There we go, that's a nice story isn't it? Even nicer that the whole thing is fixed. Of course I hate that it took so many centuries for the director's cut of this story to even come to light, but I've been asleep for so long. And I have to say I am quite impressed with the way the world has progressed in terms of technology and architecture. But I'm quite disgusted by the further perversion of this once green world. But at the end of the day, what can one lonesome piper do in a world so vast and alien to him now? Well, I suppose we'll both find out together now won't we? Well I better go on and get off of here. I'm getting hungry, and my pipe has been quiet for long enough. Third story. This story was shared by you slash Zarev too. There is something in my grandparents forest. I do not even know if it's a skinwalker, wendigo, or any other one of those paranormal creatures. But it for sure is not like what I have heard about. For the past eight years I have gone to my grandparents during the summer. The past six have had some questionable events first time I saw it was when I was seven or eight almost like it was staring at the house. Their now deceased dog, Flint, was usually the tough type, but in this moment, he looked more scared than I'd ever seen him. He noticed it first, and when I looked there, all my muscles froze. There it was, hunched down beside a rock. It looked like it would be like twelve feet if it stood tall. Ever seen a hounder from Kane Pixel's back rooms? The body was comparable to that. All of its limbs, however, were bent in odd directions, with the head ticking left and right 180 degrees. Once it backed into the forest, my senses snapped back and I screamed the most blood-curdling I ever have. My brother ran outside, worryingly asking me what s wrong. I could not speak, I just cried, cried and hyperventilated. Eventually, I pointed to the forest. My brother, obviously worried and scared, asked things like, is there something in the forest, with me nodding. We eventually went back inside, and I immediately went to draw a depiction of what I saw. Of course it was not the best drawing, but it got what I saw down. A disfigured body, oddly bending limbs, and the head twisted down to the neck. My brother seemed to kind of know what it was, or just a concept of it, and we showed it to Grandpa. Of course Grandma was worried too, it was just Grandpa, Grandma, my brother and I this summer, but she did not seem to know much about it. Grandpa though, seemed like he had encountered it multiple times. That night was the most secure night it has been since I have been there. When I tried to sleep, I heard it, a low, curdling screech. It seemed closer to my room, and when I bolted up, it ran away. That's all I remember from that summer. 
The next encounter happened when I was around 10. This time it was closer, and was not as bent down. Clearly it was some sort of demon, but I doubt even hell would have anything like that. This time my dad was also with us, but grandma and grandpa went to a town about an hour away to buy groceries and gifts, as my mom's birthday was coming up. Believe it or not, my dad, I do not know how, but I believe him, can speak to God. He can heal people, do things like dodging thrown knives, and much more he, has been with Christ ever since he was about my age, 15. Not even he, however, knew much about it. All he knows is that there, s no way it should be here, almost like it has been. It's not like any skinwalker, or wendigo. Back onto the main story, my dad had started a prayer, and the creature started reacting horridly. It let out a huge screech as its body acted against itself, and particles, I did not even know what they had been, started going in and out of it. It was like it was even rejecting the heavens itself, not allowing it to die. It ran to my dad, but the closer he got the mire his body acted out, and it eventually ran away. I have not seen much of it lately, just it lurking in the forest, but I know that one day, something bad with it will happen. It'll update if anything happens during this summer break with an edit to this post. I apologize if this does not provide much context, and it may seem fake, but please believe me. Not many people do, but my brother and I know damn well what we saw. I will also be replying to comments with questions when I can. Fourth story. This story was shared by you slash planet underscore 777. There's this old urban legend about this ice cream truck in our neighborhood. Before I was born, my mother and father grew up in this same suburban neighborhood. The year for them when this started was 1993 and they were about 12 to 13 years old, and during that time they would always spend their summers outside since it would be too hot to be parked inside reading comics or playing with toys. My parents would play on the block with a whole bunch of kids, but the ones that stuck out were Nicole, Manny, and Lee. These were the close friends of both my parents and they did pretty much everything together. The summer of 93 was extremely hot, according to my mom, so she and the rest of the group were playing with super soakers and water balloons to cool off. My dad remembered that Lee stopped what he was doing, and turned his head to see a bright white ice cream truck playing the Mr. Softy song, slowly creeping up on the street. In that moment a bunch of kids came out with their $5 bills in hand as they ran up to the radiant truck. With their wide smiles and high-pitched demands for single cones, popsicles, and snow cones, they all rushed the truck in happiness. My parents, Nicole, and Manny went inside to ask their parents for money, while Lee made his way to grab some water. As he was walking though he noticed the truck getting ready to leave as quick as when it arrived, but what was strange about the whole thing was that the kids that were by the truck were nowhere to be seen when he looked over to the window spot. It was like they all just, vanished. The only thing Lee saw was the ice cream man, giving off a friendly smile in his direction, and in the next minute he shut his window door with a slam before slowly driving away. He stood there on that empty street alone and petrified. When my parents, Nicole, and Manny finally came back outside, they saw him standing alone so they called out to him, but he still just stood there like he was in a trance. He only pointed his finger towards the direction of where the ice cream truck headed and didn't say a word. A few hours later, the police were called for the children that mysteriously disappeared at that truck and all Lee kept telling them was, it was the smiling ice cream man. The next few weeks after that incident, 
No kids were found at all and life continued on normally for my parents and their friends. There were different ice cream trucks coming and going, but Lee wouldn't ever go to them because of the fear of what he saw. It was the middle of August and summer was winding down, my parents and their friends were staying out more late than usual outside riding bikes in their neighborhood when they heard the Mr. Softy jingle again. This time everyone had their own money due to chores or other jobs around the neighborhood. My dad told me the sun was setting, but it was so humid that day that they literally rushed over to the truck on their bikes to get anything that was cold to help themselves cool down. The only one who was hesitant was Lee because he knew that the ice cream truck was sketchy. He still went over to keep an eye on his friends, but when he got over there he made sure to keep his distance. When everyone put their bikes on the curb and lined up by the truck window, everything looked fine to Lee at first. Everyone was getting their ice cream, but he noticed that the man was the same man he saw that day. He dropped my mom's ice cream and apologized as he closed the window to go fetch another one. At that moment, Lee knew it was time to go, and he didn't waste any time trying to warn everyone either. Robbie, let's just go to my house, I got a bunch of ice cream and shit. We really don't need this truck. Lee nudged my dad and whispered to him, while giving him an obvious, shit's about to go down, look in his eye according to my dad. My dad, however was telling Lee that he was just paranoid and waved him off. Lee at that moment tried again, but this time pulled my dad and told him again more seriously. My dad apparently was about to push him off when Lee told my dad about what happened the day the kids disappeared. You remember when I was talking about the smiling ice cream man? This is him. Lee told my dad in a hushed tone, so he wouldn't arouse suspicion. My dad then walked over to my mom and tried to get her to back away from the truck. But they weren't fast enough. The ice cream man came back to the window and called out to my mom. Aren't you forgetting your ice cream? My mom brushed off my dad's arm and walked over to get her cone, but she didn't notice the sprayer in the man's other hand. In one swift motion he put the sprayer up to my mom's face and before Manny, Nicole, or Lee could pull her or my dad back, they all got hit by the gas, and after a few coughing fits, all of them fell to the ground and blacked out. My parents apparently remember waking up in a poorly lit room that was only illuminated by a weak and flickering bulb. My dad was the first to wake up, seeing Manny and Nicole chained to the walls and Lee tied up in a chair next to my mom. My dad quickly looked around the room quickly and saw some of the kids from a few weeks ago, but not in the way he wanted to. Some of them had their throats slit, deep stab wounds in their faces, disemboweled, and some even having fingers cut off. It was to be put lightly as my dad called it, a horror show. He started to panic and scream, but realized that his mouth was gagged and saw that the others were too. He could hear steps coming down the stairs, creaking more and more the closer they got. He saw the ice cream man, but this time it's as if the man became something more sinister. Something darker. The man's smile was twisted into a wide malicious grin, and his eyes gave off no glint or any form of light. The clean white uniform shirt and his khaki slacks were replaced with a smock with dried up blood stains marking it like a tie-dye shirt. In his hands he was holding a large hunting knife that looked dangerously sharp and well polished, that it started to reflect brightly off the dim light. He walked over to my mother and lifted up her chin with his hand. I'm gonna have some fun with you before I snuff that pretty little light out of you. He said with a greasy smile. My dad tried to struggle out of his restraints to help my mom, but the ropes were too strong for him to get out of. 
The man then walked over to Lee and looked at him with intensity in his eyes. You. This could have been so easier if you didn't open your mouth. Following his slightly hushed voice was swift right hook aimed right for Lee's cheek. My dad heard his cheek give off a loud crack and his muffled grunts behind the gag. He could see Lee starting to have tears in his eyes, but gave the evil adult a defiant look and stared him down. Ha 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 ha, you think you got guts kid? We'll fucking see. The man started to laugh maliciously as he walked over to Manny and ran the knife lightly across his throat as he bought it to the cloth gag and gave it an easy slice. So kid, your friend over there thinks he's tough. You wanna prove him wrong? He put the knife up to Manny's cheek and gave it a light cut. Help us we're stuck in here. Help. Manny tried to call out to anyone at all, but all the vile man did was laugh hysterically. You can scream all you want, no one will hear you. No one at all. The man said with a wide grin as he held the knife close to Manny's face. You weird shithead. And with that, Manny headbutt the man in the nose. The man stammered back and held his bleeding nose in his hand, my dad noticed that his eyes were more malicious and full of contempt after that hit, and then an awkward silence filled the room. The man looked at Manny with a deadpan, soulless stare and flashed that friendly smile he showed us hours ago. Then in that moment, he ran up to Manny and stabbed him in the stomach. My dad tried to get out of his restraints to help, but the ropes were knotted too tight. My parents had to watch in horror as their friend was brutally gutted and stabbed over and over in his chest, his face, and even in his head to the point where brain and viscera was everywhere on the man. He rubbed Manny's blood on his face and let out a deep exhale. He walked over to a cabinet in the room and pulled out a scalpel and slowly walked over to Nicole. The thumps were the only thing echoing in the room as Lee and my parents looked in despair as he walked up to her and held the scalpel right over her left eye. He then brushed the hair out of her face and hovered the scalpel dangerously close to her pupil. Your eyes. The man said as he started to breathe frantically. Nicole tried to struggle, but the man held her head firmly on the wall, staring deeply into her eyes as he waved the blade over them. They just look so pure, and full of hope, he looked over to Lee and then said, you still got guts kid? With that remark, the man raised his arm back getting ready to use it. Nicole tried to shake her head to move out of the way but it was hopeless as the scalpel pierced her eye and the man smiled widely in glee. He took off the gag so that he could hear her cry in agony. The remaining group watched with tears running down their cheeks, they watched him wiggle around the scalpel deeper and deeper into her eye as Nicole's cries became primal and unnerving. My dad recalled trying to fray the ropes even more to help, but it seemed like he didn't need to as he heard footsteps rushing down the stairs quickly. Due to the street cams on the stoplights, the police were called, and they came to the house where the truck was parked at, and went down to the basement, they all had their weapons drawn as they saw the man picking out Nicole's eye and looking at the officers with an evil and sadistic smile. The officers screamed at him to put his hands up, but he just walked slowly towards them. That's when my dad heard gunshots and saw the bullets hitting the man in the body. He still kept moving with each shot and started to raise his hunting knife to strike, while gurgling in excitement due to his wounds. The officers finally put him down with a shot to the head and he fell back onto the ground, never to move again. Years passed and my parents alongside with Lee and Nicole never really got over the situation, and they still felt like Malcolm and I weren't safe in the neighborhood. 
I wish I could say they were wrong, I really wish I could. The legend however still reigns true to this day, and here's how it goes. Every summer onward after the incident, you could hear the Mr. Softy jingle in the neighborhood in the middle of the night. It gets louder and louder the more you try to ignore it. If you look out the window to see what's causing the sound, you will see a ice cream truck in the shadows with a figure looking out of it. If you look into his red eyes, you will walk towards his truck and be taken away and vanish. Malcolm and I didn't believe in it because it sound crazy at first, but then it made sense. A lot of kids who went missing after the incident apparently sneaked out, and no traces of a struggle was noted. This means that most of the kids had to be targeted by that song, due to one kid being lucky enough to get restrained by his dad. As soon as he snapped out of his trance he looked around scared asking if the song stopped. However, I was sadly still skeptical because some of the kids that were targeted had histories of mental illnesses and issues like psychosis, so it got hard to believe in after a while. We talked about it one night over the phone, and he was understandably scared. What if we start hearing that shit? My mom lost her eye bro. His voice got a little shaky. I don't want to end up like that man. I reassured him that everything would be fine and that the man that did all that has been long dead. I told him that nothing would happen to him since we literally live right across the street from each other and to call me if something happens. With that we both called it a night and went to sleep. I had a dream where I was walking down some steps leading down to a dim light. As I walked towards it I could smell something decaying, and as I reached the end of the steps, the light brightened up the entire room. Bodies of kids were everywhere, dismembered and eviscerated. I tried my hardest not to throw up, and as I looked around I noticed him. The man was in back of the basement at a table, sharpening his knife. He stopped suddenly and slowly turned to meet my eyes. He flashed that wide and malicious grin that I only heard about in recalls from my parents. With a laugh, he charged towards me ready to strike and as I put out my hands to guard myself, I woke up. I caught my breath, telling myself in my head that I was okay and I was alive. Stupid fucking story. I told myself as I pulled up the covers and turned on phone to ease my mind with YouTube. As I put in my passcode, I heard a song that sounded all too familiar. It was the jingle of an ice cream truck, and it was getting louder and louder by the minute. Turns out the legend was true after all. Fifth story. This story was shared by you slash stolen ketamine. I am being stalked and I don't know what to do. It is a nice summer day. The breeze is amazing, the smell of flowers grazed my nose, looking in the man-made pond in my backyard, the trees, and I mirrored back, the calm rippling water as the fish swam. What a nice day for a hike I thought. I checked the weather app too in case of any weather changes or weather alerts, my app said there was a 70% chance of light rain, which is fine with me, who doesn't love a little rain. The smell, and the feel. I live in an area surrounded by trees and nature, it is honestly such a beautiful land for living, I know the area like the back of my hand we have a set of two trails, a shallow creek that leads you to a beautiful opening in the mountain tops, all tied off with a do not trespass sign so the land is all for me and my family and the animals. Today I made my way to trail one. Trail 1 is about a 10-mile trail all around, it circles around a small neighborhood about 4 miles out. I am familiar with a lot of people around in this neighborhood considering I walk these trails almost every weekend. There is a nice man who lives in a small blue house with a garden in his front lawn. 
He always waves as I'm passing by while watering his flowers. Before I started my hike I picked up a small backpack to take with me. In this backpack I have three water bottles, two granola bars and a small pocket knife. Starting the trail with a smile on my face I was excited. The weather is perfect. I can see and hear the birds, the squirrels scrambling up the trees shaking the leaves as I pass by, and the sound of the small animals rustling in the bushes trying to hide from me. After a good 22 minutes into my hike I was one mile in, I stopped to take a sip of water and to take a short breather, I sat on the small stub that I passed by where a withered tree had used to stand but has now fallen due to a strong thunderstorm we had a few months back. While sitting I see a cute little bunny passing, how cute, how fluffy and fragile I thought, I cracked open my first water bottle with my teeth and found tamed it into my mouth but that's when I heard it, a loud blood curdling scream come deep from within the woods the bunny now scared off and me standing up looking around pondered on the thought of what that might be, I can't think of any animals that live in these woods that could make such a sound. I try to dismiss it as it may be a group of teens who found their way into the woods ignorantly ignoring the no trespassing sign. Continuing with my hike I was now nearing the neighborhood with the crunch of gravel and leaves under my feet, what a satisfying sound, until it was interrupted with that ear bleeding screech again. God what the fuck could make that noise, it was louder this time. Still trying to wrap my head around what that awful noise was I continue through the woods paranoid that's when the rain starts falling. I see something in the corner of my eye, a figure as fast as lightning launching itself through the woods too fast to see and too far gone to be identifiable. Maybe it was a fox. Well if it wanted to hurt me it wouldn't be running away from me. Right? Again that screaming sound, but this time it is near, right behind me. It hurt. I slipped in the mud and fell to the ground as I held my ears covering them with my hands almost crying lying on the ground letting the rain hit my face. The pain. Oh my god. The pain. My ears now ringing due to that noise like shattering glass. I stood up glancing around even more paranoid than before I then took the time to look down at my hands. Blood. Blood everywhere. My ears are bleeding. And that's when I saw IT or. Well. Them in the corner of my eye, I looked up. Many figures stood in the distance behind trees watching me. Tall, very tall at least nine feet each, lengthy and skinny, they are the color of a black void and their eyes. I will never forget their eyes, they are pure white. Staring into them is giving me the most uncomforting unwelcoming feeling. It was like they want me gone, like they want me to get out. As if this is their woods and their land. Their arms were long, nearly dragging the ground, their hands were claws. Sharp, oh so very sharp disgustingly long. One of them slowly started dragging their claws on the tree leaving a scratch mark and that awful screaming noise which I now know was coming from them and their unhinged mouths. One started tilting its head slowly while doing so its neck made a cracking sound. Oh. My. God. Its neck. Stretching and growing in length making a breaking and snapping sound as it's getting longer and taller. I had no plans to stay and try to make friends with these ungodly creatures, I just want to get out. I started to run, I didn't look back. I heard the leaves and plants getting mauled through behind me as if something was chasing me. Don't look back. Don't look back. I repeat to myself, but I'm curious and an idiot, 
letting my curiosity get the best of me I turned around for a split second and that's when I saw six giant beastly creatures charging at me like a wolf pack chasing a small bunny, their claws digging into the dirt launching themselves forwards to get close to me. One of them hooked my shoulder with their claws dragging me down to the ground, I hit my head so hard onto the rock below me I blacked out for a second. While having whiplash and my instinct for survival I remembered my pocket knife. Shit. I forgot my backpack. I looked back up and a giant creature pinning me down slowly moving in towards my face with its unhinged jaw drooling over me letting its awful horrid breath that smells like roadkill fill my nose, this is it I know this is about to be my end, it is about to sink its teeth into me. At this point I would do anything to just survive. I am not about to be this thing's dinner, I bent my knees into my chest and kicked the creature in the stomach, during the creature's confusion and vulnerability it loosened its grip of me and I managed to get one of my arms free I started to jab it in the sides with my fists and started to scratch at its eyes, it shrieked in pain and let go of me. I scrambled up and bolted back through the woods finally making it to the small neighborhood. I ran up to the old man gardening and begged him to help me, he hurried me inside, catered my wounds, and let me rest in his basement on his couch. When I was feeling a little better I explained everything that had happened to him and he looked at me in horror. I am going to be sick, he said holding his mouth running to the kitchen sink. I hurried over to him asking what was going on he then said to me, you saw a wendigo you're lucky to have even made it out of its grasp. I'm now writing this one year into the future and I still hear those awful screaming noises from deep within the forest, every now and then I still feel like I am being watched. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.